What is up guys? Welcome back to the channel. This is 12 inch PV penis and we are hitting you guys up with the comprehensive beginner guide. I got a whole lot of questions on the stream and this should be the one stop shop for all the information you'll probably need as a beginner guide. So first I'm going to go over the topics we're going to go over. There are going to be timestamps in the description below and obviously there's also going to be chapters. So if you guys want to skip around that's pretty good. But if you're just playing the game a lot of the times you won't actually know the things you don't know. So if that is the case you should probably just sit down, grab a drink, get some food, watch it all out and then you'll be thoroughly prepared to play this game uh, for early, mid and then transition well into late game. So first we're going to go over the Civ choice. It's one of the most common things people ask. It's not actually that important but obviously we're going to go over it because when I first started playing I just started slamming it. Next is going to be your first steps. What to do when you make your jumper. If you're going to make a jumper should you do that? How you should develop immediately, farm, stuff like that. Then we're gonna have speed up usage, what's the most efficient way to do it, and when you should use your speed ups as well as how you're gonna get them. Four is going to be your building upgrade order. Five is gonna be your research upgrade order. Six is going to be your grindable resources. This is gonna be alliance credits, perhaps just regular physical resources, maybe stars, books, stuff like that. And then we're gonna have AP usage. That's gonna be really important. Uh, it's one of the, the most integral parts to growing your account, especially early game. We're gonna have gem management is number eight. Number nine is going to be commanders. Number 10 is going to be gear. Number 11 is going to be expedition. Also one of those things that isn't super important, but in the beginning of the game can be a little overwhelming. 12 is going to be Sunset Canyon. 13 is going to be events. 14 is going to be KBK. Uh, not super important when you first start the game, but going over what it is and answering some questions about it is probably going to help tremendously. 15 is going to be uh, like miscellaneous small things like camps and keeps, covering the map, and things like guardians. 16 is going to be do's and don'ts, kind of like social norms within your alliance. And as a bonus, 17 is going to be a general spending guide. Originally, I wasn't going to put something like that. Obviously, I'm an FTP content creator, but I've done enough account coaching to where I feel comfortable uh, suggesting a order of progression in terms of spending and how to get the most bang for your buck and what I would spend if I did spend. If you guys don't know who I am, I am the world record uh, holder for the F2P to T5, so I did so within 182 days. If you guys have just started the game, that's really, really fast. And I could have done it faster, I just chose to do it with more style. Everything I tell you is, is stuff I do or stuff I wish I had done that would greatly help your account uh, progress in the fastest and most efficient way possible. Chapter one is going to be your civilization choice. A lot of people put a lot of stock in this. It's not super important. If you've already messed this up, it's not a huge issue. Originally, the first two choices that people used to look at would be China and Britain. I don't think Britain is terrible, but China is going to be your choice. If you just started the game, China is going to have Sun Tzu, which is the single best ever commander in the game, bar none. It's not even close. So you always want him as your primary commander. When you choose the civilization, obviously you get the civilization itself. However, you also get a starting commander right? And the starting commander, you want to be the strongest commander you possibly have access to, and you don't want something like Boudicca for Britain. She's good as a peacekeeper, but she's not great overall. Whereas like China is your pound for pound strongest epic commander, and it's not close. You start out with China, you have your Sun Tzu, it's probably going to be your first expertise. And then when you get to CH-17, I would suggest swapping from China into Germany. Now, if you swap at CH-10 from China into Germany, it's still okay. Generally, it's just like on the first few days, you're pushing as hard as you can building wise to make sure you go to CH-17, which will unlock your fourth march. I'll go more into detail about this later, but generally the earlier you swap into Germany, the better. Waiting until CH-17 is generally the latest I would go, and then I would stay there. I would not worry about the war buffs. In terms of like your special unit, it doesn't matter if you're going cavalry, it doesn't matter if you're going archers, it doesn't matter if you're going infantry. All of these units are going to be more impactful late game, but early game, the only things you're looking for is going to be the utility building speed and the action point recovery. Action point recovery is like bar none, the most important stat you can get, especially early game, because action points are going to gatekeep you from tier five units. They're going to gatekeep you from further pushing your account and uh, from different grindable resources. So the more action points you have, the further your account's going to go. So 10% action point recovery is like 260 points per day, roughly. So 100 days, 26,000 action points, pretty good, right? If you value action points at around one gem a piece, it's like 260 extra gems per day. Incredibly valuable. I would definitely, most certainly swap to Germany as fast as you can. Just for uh, transparency, I will go in uh, what you would swap to later, but if you're early game, don't pay attention to this. So once you hit your tier five units, you can swap from Germany into France. Uh, I go into this on my civilization choice video, and you guys can see that if you want, but you can go from Germany into France once you hit T5, and then after tier five, you keep it all the way up until VIP 15. 
Then at VIP 15, you can choose either the Ottoman Empire or Vikings, or you can stick with France, and they're all fine choices. Again, VIP 15 is super late game, and tier 5 is like right on the cusp of late game, right? Once you hit T5, you kind of are in the end game. So with that context, pick China, swap to Germany, stay with Germany uh, for a good long while. Chapter 2. First steps. So when you start the game for the very first time, there's going to be a whole lot of stuff and it's going to be super overwhelming. So the very first few things you should do, the most important things are going to be number one is either make sure you jumped or uh, make sure you've made an informed decision why not to jump. So as of the recording of this video, jumping has been nerfed quite a few times. So jumping for context is going to be when you start an account in a previous kingdom. Let's say I started an account in 2965. Then I would be given a beginner immigration, which is a pseudo passport for people that are under city hall level eight. With this beginner's immigration, you can wait up to 10 days and then migrate forward into a new kingdom. This isn't bad but it is a shadow of what it used to be and it's almost wasting time uh compared to what you could just do if you just started in a new kingdom or did a much shorter jump so if you're looking for a jumper group or more information on jumps you should go to the discords in the description below in my discord i'm eventually going to make a section where you can advertise your jumps and you should also go to the official rise of kingdoms discord it's going to be the hashtag recruiting you tab and in there there's going to be plenty of jumper groups even if you don't end up jumping, you've made the informed decision and you decided that jumping isn't for you because you have more information and you want the 1.5 mil skin, or you just don't think the, the juice is worth the squeeze, that's totally fine. Just make sure that whatever kingdom you go to has a jumper group going into it. Jumper groups uh, generally have uh, people that have played the game previously, and there's not always the best leadership in all the jumper groups, but whatever leadership you have access to is going to be greatly better than the natives of that kingdom because they're going to be previous players that have some kind of leadership experience. So the larger the jumper group that's going to the kingdom that you're going, the more likely it is that you win your first kingdom versus kingdom, which I'll go into more detail later, but it's going to be very good for your account. So the stronger your kingdom is, the better it is for you. The more gold chests you get, the more progression you have. So even if you don't jump, make sure you go to a kingdom where people are jumping, regardless if you jump or not. And if you're looking for a jumper, go to the Rise of Kingdoms official Discord, hashtag recruiting YouTube. There you go. So next, you've jumped into your kingdom or you've started your new account. And there are a bunch of alliance. Which alliance do you choose? So you want to go to the alliance with the highest gift level. You want the most gold chests humanly possible. This generally is the top alliance, but if it's not the top alliance, the gold chests are much more important than actually being with the highest power. So if the highest gift level alliance is like number two or number three, because there are a bunch of jumpers that are continuing in number one, but most of them are free to play. Free to play players uh, can be active and they can be good for your kingdom, but they're not good for your personal account. So you want the most gold chests you can possibly get. So make sure you're aiming for the highest gift level alliance, or if you've got your ear to the ground, make sure you're going where the gold chests are. Getting into a top alliance. Generally, uh, when you jump into a kingdom and you have like two to nine days worth of extra time, you're gonna finish your jump like somewhere around like 400K, 500K power. This would immediately get you into the top alliance or the top gift level alliance in uh, most situations. Um, however, if you're not jumping, you're going to have to push pretty hard, pretty quickly to try and make sure that you can do that. So just be very cognizant that generally you don't want to spend speed ups inefficiently. Uh, I'll go more into more detail into this in the speed up section and the building and research order sections as well into how you should spend your speeds and like what kind of power ups you're looking for. It's just generally there are exceptions to the rules of how you could spend your speeds most efficiently uh, when you're looking to getting in the top alliance because getting those gold chests means more speed ups. And if you're using speed ups to get speed ups, you're generally subsidizing your growth. That's really good. Make sure you consider that getting into the top uh, gift level alliance is generally a matter of number one being social, number two being active, and number three pushing a decent amount of power early or jumping. Next is going to be farms. Farms are super important, ridiculously important to progressing this game. I used to think, oh, like one farm is good, two farms is good, you know, three is like a sweet spot. You really, really need farms if you're going to progress, especially early game. As you get further into the game and you max all your buildings, uh, buildings are some of the most expensive things you can do in this game. So if you're not max buildings, you're going to need a ton of resources to continue progressing. I would personally suggest making three farms. They are tedious. It's going to take maybe like 20 minutes a day to you know spend the AP and, and put some upgrades and send out your gathers like three times. Like It's very tedious and it's super annoying, but if you really want to progress, especially early game, you're going to need those farms, especially if you're trying to stay in the top gift level alliance. Um, it just requires like a level of activity to where unless you're, you know, blowing racks 
uh, on the game, in which I guess you can, you probably should still have farms. But if you're if you're free to play or low spender, these farms are gonna be absolutely crucial to your progression in the game. I also have a farm video, so be sure to check that out if you're interested in what civs to pick and you know other information on that. You've dropped into your kingdom. You are in the top gift level alliance, and you have one to three farms. Now that you've done this, you should be focusing on streamlining CH17. So in this game, there are breakpoints for your city hall level. These breakpoints are going to be CH5, CH11, CH17, and CH22. The reason why these are considered breakpoints is because every time you hit one of these, you get an extra troop dispatch queue. So going from one march to two marches is doubling your resource or gem income to two to three is plus 33%, plus three to four, plus 25%, plus four to five, plus 20%. So obviously your fourth breakpoint is going to be much more impactful than your fifth breakpoint, but they're still really impactful. So the very first thing you should be looking to do is pushing up to CH17. Obviously in my uh, building upgrade order, I'm gonna talk more about that, but CH17 should be the very first thing you look to do. Not only do you get a fourth march, uh, you get access to gathering gems at CH16, and you also get access to gear. Your blacksmith is going to produce like 300 to 450 gems worth of gear every single day. So the faster you are CH16, the faster you start getting access to this. Every day that you're not CH16 is a day that you're not getting those few hundred gems every single day. And obviously this level of passive income where all you have to do is flick rocks four times every 15 hours for, for like a few hundred gems worth of stuff is really, really good. So make sure you get there as fast as you can. So in terms of upgrading your farms, you've made your three farms and you have your main. People will ask like, how how upgraded should my farms be uh, in relation to your main? So you have the breakpoints of 17, 22 and breakpoints like that. You should generally have your farms one breakpoint behind you. So if you hit CH, uh, CH17, your farms should still be on three marches. If you hit CH22, your farm should come up to four marches at CH17. That's generally how I would upgrade them. I would not overinvest in your farms because obviously your main's going to take priority and your farms are going to be at CH25 before you know it, right? You just got to make sure that you can not rock the boat early game and you can stay in the top of lines by growing consistently. In terms of gems, sculptures, speed ups, any kind of consumables that you will find in your backpack, any of this stuff, until you finish this video, if you've just started the game, do not spend any of this. Okay, I mean, actually nothing. You don't wanna mess up your account. You don't wanna to have to be in a situation where you have to restart. Honestly, well, I guess you just started the game. Uh, you may end up restarting after watching this video with your new information. But if you've just started, maybe you've, you've dropped like a couple hundred bucks, make sure that you do not spend anything else until you clear this video. I'm gonna go in depth on how to spend everything and where you should spend and why you should spend. So just don't spend anything. The next thing that you should do, now that you're not spending anything, right? Right guys, we wouldn't do that, is you're gonna to wanna to scout the map. Obviously, once you get to a certain point, your entire map is going to defog itself. However, I manually scouted my entire map as you should manually scout your entire map. You should also look to take all the medium and high caves. If you are jumping, you should make sure to clear all the mediums and all the highs. And then once you get to your final kingdom, I would just clear all the highs because if you ever migrate after that, um, once you hit a certain amount of caves, I believe it's around 400, you'll no longer have access to the higher medium cave rewards and they'll all be level one rewards. So if you want higher level caves, make sure you clear just the mediums and the highs in the first kingdom and then just the highs for every kingdom past that. If you guys want the locations to all the high caves in the game, there are four possible maps, A, B, C, and D, and all of those cords are going to be in the description below in the cave coordinates. It's gonna be a little Google doc, so just use that, scout around, get all the high caves. If you guys are jumping, just make sure you don't open all the cave rewards before you finish jumping because whenever you migrate in this game, you have to have less resources than your storehouse can hold. And if you've just started and you're like CH7, that's obviously obviously gonna be basically nothing. So if you open all your caves and you have like 40 mil of every resource, and then now you have to delete it before you jump, you basically fried your account. So just be careful with how you're doing that. Next is going to be places uh, where you can join for more information. Obviously this video is pretty in depth. However, if you guys are looking for good information sources, discerning good versus bad information is gonna be one of the best skills you can have in this game. Now you're a little early on, so you're a little uh, moldable. Let's say you're like wet clay. Uh, so this video is going to do you pretty well, but I would join the official Rise of Kingdoms Discord. All these specific troop discords is going to be for archers, cavalry, and infantry, and I would join my Discord in the description below. All of these places are going to be great resources to where if you ask questions, you're generally going to get good answers. If you want to make sure that you're getting good answers, you can ask the same questions in different discords, and then you can compare their answers with one another and find out which ones make more intuitive sense. Another thing I would do is I would sub to my YouTube channel. A little bit of a shameless plug there, but obviously I release really good content and basically all my videos are gonna cover some kind of informational content. And on top of that, I stream uh, most days and in those streams, you can basically ask anything you want. Not like I'm gonna charge you for information.
Chapter three, boys. Okay, so we have passed the absolute bare bottom basics of like wiping your ass once you get into the KD. Now we're gonna get in the more technical side of things. Where should you spend things and what order you should do it? This is gonna be a whole lot of information. So again, you know, if you guys have to take breaks, make sure you do. You should be paying like pretty close attention to all of this. So if you hear something that you don't quite understand, you can use one of the resources that we talked about uh, earlier. To go into discord about it or you can comment or you can at me on my discord and then i'd be more than happy to elaborate on some things if you don't understand things for especially the next few chapters it's very important that you ask questions because these are critical towards growing your account efficiently so speed ups we love them know what they are you know they, they train troops they heal troops they research they build all this great stuff right we only have a limited amount of speed ups you will be tethered by your time you'll be tethered by your wallet so if you have only a limited amount of speed ups those speed ups will go further or shorter depending on how efficiently you spend them. So in this game, when you first start, uh, you're only going to have access to very small sanctums or holy sites as they're called. When you kill these guardians, they're going to drop runes. Okay, and you can go to the map and you can collect them and they'll be there for about eight hours and they can have different buffs. So this rune might have building and research speed by 2%. This one might have training speed by 3%, group attack, resource production, all that good stuff. These holy sites will start at sanctums right? Then they'll go to altars, which are going to be the level two ones. Then they'll go to shrines, which will be the level three ones. And then they'll go to the lost temple, which is going to be this. If you want to spend your speed ups in the single most efficient way possible, you should not be spending mass quantities of speed ups early game without a purpose. A good example of high value things that will be the number one way you can spend speed ups in this game is going to be the 15% runes that you can find here. So over here is a 10% rune. You generally wouldn't want to be blowing large amounts of speed ups with this. You'd want to wait till a 15% rune. Now this is for healing, so it's not super useful, but you can find a 15% building, training, and research. On top of that, your king can submit something called a kingdom buff. So when a alliance captures the lost temple, the leader of that alliance is going to be considered the king, and he can spend a certain amount of gems to release a kingdom buff. So with the lost temple, you get a 15% boost from one of the runes. Then your king can release a kingdom buff, which will be an extra 10%. And then on top of that, you have access to something called titles. Generally, uh, titles are free flowing within the kingdom. So you have Duke, Architect, and Scientist. These will boost training speed, building speed, and research speed, respectively. So the most effective way to spend your speed ups is to wait for a 15% rune, a kingdom buff, a title, all your helps, and when your alliance tech is maxed. So your alliance technology is going to be over here, and it's going to be city construction one, City Construction 2, Technology Research 2, Technology Research 1, right? All of this stuff is going to be super important to making your speedups go as far as you can. So make sure you have all of this stuff every single time you put in an upgrade, unless you have a very good reason to do so, perhaps something like an event. A good example of a good reason uh, to push without all of this stuff, except for helps, helps should always be pushed, would be going for CH17 or CH22 early game. These breakpoints are incredibly important early game. And being able to get more marches to gather gems or grind out different events is really, really important. So a good example of this is when I pushed 1.7 million power for our first game of power. This early into the game, I didn't have access to a kingdom title. I didn't have access to get Eva for a 15% rune or any of that. But I really wanted to get to CH22 because I wanted a fifth march. So it was okay in this situation for me to push it. So if you know specifically a situation in which you would perhaps complete an event or for a very mild competition, I would not look to push this hard uh, for the average player early game, or you have a goal in mind in terms of like City Hall 17 or City Hall 22, that's all pretty good. And that's probably okay times to use your speed ups. Um, I would not make a habit of that, especially early game. Generally pushing events early game is pretty bad. So I just use this as an example of when I personally would push, just make sure that you're using your resources, like the Rise of Kingdoms research calculator and the Rise of Kingdoms building calculator to know exactly how much it would cost in speed ups and in resources to build or research whatever you're looking for and how much power you would get and then cross-reference that with the current rankings and how far you think people will go. I will include those calculators in the description below. Now you know how you should spend your speed ups. Now the next question is where should you spend your speed ups? So for CH17 uh, and CH22, I think it's perfectly fine to use some of your universal speed ups on buildings. However, this is almost the only time that I would ever suggest that. 
Your universal speed ups should almost in no circumstances ever go into training and they should in no circumstances ever go to healing. All of your universal speed ups should double as research speed ups. They're essentially both the same thing. When you first start the game, if I remember correctly, you're about five years away from getting to tier five. Tier five should be your ultimate goal in terms of speeds and your account uh, to break into late game. And so in order to do that, you have to be very careful with where you spend your universal speed ups. If you blow like a couple hundred days early, that could be a really tough loss to recuperate later. So make sure basically everything's going into tech. I would never, ever, ever put any into healing. And I would say almost never into troops. I wouldn't say never specifically because uh, sometimes if you're doing really well on like a 20 gold head event and you're in like second place and you're shooting for first or something, I would consider using a few days, but I would never like all in on troops. And I would certainly never spend on healing. Um, there are certain situations where you can spend on building, but for the vast majority of the time, it should all go into research. Uh, T5 is a absolute mountain. And if you don't treat it like it's going to be a mountain, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot before a very, very long marathon. Chapter four. So now you know how to use your speed ups. Now is going to be the building upgrade order. So generally, again, you should not be using speed ups on your buildings, but this should be the way you natural your buildings. Naturaling is a term I'm going to use to describe to let something uh, tick down without speeding it up. A good example of this would be this research for heavy frame. I have not touched this at all, and this has been ticking down for about a month right? It just, it does not matter. I don't have to use my speed ups on it. I'm naturaling this entire thing. And then eventually uh, I'm going to use it to like get a pretty decent place on an event. And it's going to be absolutely free because I naturaled it. In terms of buildings, the number one thing that you're going to be looking to upgrade is going to be your city hall. Again, we have those breakpoints where we're talking about how many marches you can take, but even more so than that, your city hall is going to control what level the rest of your buildings can get and it's going to control your troop capacity in your marches. All of these things considered, your city hall is going to be your single most important building. This is not at all like Clash of Clans, and it's not at all like Game of War or like other kingdom builders generally. There are no repercussions for pushing forward in city hall. In fact, you will generally find yourself getting better daily rewards and better event rewards. It doesn't matter what city hall you are, you're going to compete with the highest people in the kingdom every single time. So there's no benefit there. And making all your buildings equal is essentially just wasting time in the grand scheme of things. And time is of the essence early game. So right after your city hall, the very next thing I would focus on every single time you rank up would be your alliance center. Your alliance center is going to give you an extra help basically every single time you upgrade. And extra helps are awesome because each help is going to constitute 1% removed. And I want to say about two minutes extra on top of that, depending on your alliance deck. It has uh, diminishing returns because it's 1% of the current time every time. So 30% isn't actually like a flat 30%. I'm sure it's somewhere like 20 something. But the point is, is it's really, really useful. And having like 20 something percent of every research removed is awesome. So I would focus on getting that first. I would not focus on your resource buildings or your hospitals. This is something that people are just really, really tempted to do early game because your resource buildings, number one, are going to get you more resources. So people think, ah, like I'm going to see returns on this. You will almost never see returns early game on your, your resource node uh, upgrades. They're not going to give you a lot of power. They're not going to give you a lot of resources and they're completely useless in terms of your grind. Your hospitals at least have some grindable usefulness. They're low speed up cost, they're high power, and they're high resource cost. High resource cost is really, really, really bad early game. So unless your city hall specifically asks for one hospital to be teched further, then I would upgrade that hospital. You will almost never be in a situation where your hospitals will consistently be higher than your total troop count. If you get zeroed, you get zeroed. An extra 10,000 or 20,000 troops isn't really going to change uh, how damaging that is to your account. In fact, it'll be worse because instead of investing for resources somewhere else, say City Hall, you will invest it in your hospital for like an extra 20,000 troops. And you know, that's not very useful. Buildings in this game are super resource intensive. Uh, we went over that a bit earlier. So when you streamline your city hall, make sure you use the resources in the description below, like the Rise of Kingdoms uh, calculator. So that resource is going to give you a selection where you can select what building you want to upgrade, and it's going to give you all the requirements for that building. If I just upgraded my city hall and I have two builders, one of my builders is going to go to my alliance center and the other is probably going to go to my quarry, right? And then after that, one is going to go to my tavern and one is going to go to whatever other building that this is going to require. And then after that, it's going to go to another building that it requires in my wall. And then I'm going to go to the next city hall. You're going to have all the information you need to upgrade every city hall by using the rock building calculator in the description below. It's really important that you use that in order to plan out how you're going to have to push. Your builder should also never be idle. This seems kind of common sense, but you know, obviously I should repeat stuff. It is a beginner guide. You may find a time where using speed ups is okay if you have only one builder busy for any reason. Let's say the last thing you need to upgrade your next building is your wall and you have one builder on your 
wall and then you have everything built up as far as you can for the requirements for the next city hall, then you'd consider speeding something up. However, if you use the building resource, like for example, going to like CH23, you're going to end up needing like all of your military buildings at level 23. If you have uh, only one builder and the other builder is doing something crucial for the city hall, you can consider bringing up your troop training buildings because obviously that's something you're going to need in the future, but you can get all that information again on that resource. If you're ever going to speed up buildings, generally using building speed ups, the buildings that I would suggest to speed up are always your academy. You should never, ever, ever just have this building. The reason why is because every second that you are not researching is a second you're losing an opportunity cost. So if I have this academy building for like three days, I'm losing three days of research. Because I'm naturaling it with buildings, I'm essentially in a roundabout way, I'm using my universal speed ups in terms of my, my natural actual like time ticking down. I'm using them on building when I could be using them on research. So. If you ever have the academy building, you should almost always speed it up. I would only upgrade it during an event generally, and then I would speed it up also during the event to try and get some value off of that. I would also consider doing the same with training buildings. It's much less important because missing like a couple thousand troops is almost completely negligible in the grand scheme of things. But this is another thing where it's like, if you have these buildings building, you're not actually training any troops and then you're losing speed ups like that as well. It's much, much less important than with the academy. So just be cognizant of that. But those are the two buildings that I'd probably focus on uh, speeding up if you are looking at any building to speed up. Getting to castle 25 and getting to tier five is going to take you about a year. So just be very efficient with how you're doing this. Uh, you're playing the long game. Now you could do it faster depending on how well you plan and how disciplined you are and how active you are. Um, I would just be very focused on keeping this as concise as possible and keeping your build tight. If not, uh, you're going to delay yourself. Lastly, in terms of building order, uh, a lot of people are going to talk to you about your castle. Castle 25 is going to be needed for Academy 25, and then Academy 25 is going to be needed for Tier 5. That's going to be important way later in the future. I would not concern yourself about that now. I'm going to go over the castle and like how I would upgrade that in my gem spending guide. The castle isn't really going to be something uh, super important. If you're doing forts and you have some extra books, you can toss it in the castle, but it's not important to getting to CH25, and neither is the watchtower, so I would not spend uh, any gems here. A quick little disclaimer. Okay, our fifth topic here is going to be your research upgrade order. This is probably going to be one of the most important parts of the guide alongside like your gem spending. So pay some attention if you actually want to get to late game and you want to succeed. So first you have two tabs here. You got your economic technology and your military technology. Your economic technology is generally going to be high resource cost, low speed up cost, and your military tech is going to be high speed up cost, low resource cost. With this context, the events that you're going to want to participate in if you're looking at a power event, you're generally going to want to be spending resources and speeding up this because it's going to cost less speed ups and it's going to give you more for it. If you're looking to natural, which is the word I use to uh, let something tick down without using speed ups, things you're going to want to natural are going to be in the military tech. As you see, I'm naturaling something right now. This is going to be pretty high power, but it's going to take a whole lot of days of speed ups. So if I'm not really doing anything with my academy, letting this tick down over a very long period of time is totally okay. And then speeding it up once you get to an event or just collecting it when you have an event. This is generally something you want to do further in the game. So if you're looking for a now or never event, it's probably good to speed up military technology for that. If you're looking at a game of power event, it's probably good to speed up economic technology. So the techs that you're going to want to go for early game, you're only going to want to be gathering gems on your main account. I'm going to go uh, further into that, into the gem guide and the grindable resources guide. As context for this, you generally want to be gathering only resources on your main account. So for your main account, the very first thing you're going to want is jewelry. This is going to be CH16. It's going to allow you to gather gems and you're going to want to be gathering gems. With that context, you're not going to need scythe. You're not going to need whipsaw stone saw shaft mining all of this stuff that gives you resources you don't really care about the only thing you need on your main account right now is gems and your farms will be doing all the farming for you which is why you have three farms so engineering and mathematics give you building speed and research speed respectively these are super duper important you can get these to uh, level 10 by ch21 this is the single most important thing that you should be beelining for just as soon as you access them they are absolutely awesome they're super high resource costs and they're going to be really integral to your pushing late game. After that, machinery and cunning and polishing are also amazing. I keep these to the highest level you can get them every single time you push City Hall. Now you won't be able to max them until you hit Academy 25, but having nine and nine on these is perfectly fine. For uh, T5, you're going to be needing everything in this tree. You just don't need it right now, especially early game. It's just a waste of resources and it's not gonna give you any returns, especially if you're only gathering gems. In terms of military technology, it is almost completely worthless early game. I'm not saying it's worthless forever. And obviously once you get to your first combat with people in KVK about three months in, it will be good, right? 
when you first start like your first two months, like there's almost no reason to really focus too hard on this. What I would focus on is the first thing I would do is getting tier two is fine. Once you hit like CH8 or like CH16 or 17, getting your tier two units is whatever. It's fine to progress your main quest line and that's totally okay. The thing that I would not do is I would not go past tier two. Tier three isn't super useful and tier four isn't super useful right now. And the reason why it's not useful is because you simply cannot train the manpower required for these to bear fruit. So if you unlock tier three units, your main quest is going to give you 10,000. And over a couple days, right, when I say tier three units, I mean one singular unit, you're going to be unlocking it, you're going to get 10,000 from the quest, and then you're probably going to get like a thousand every day. With that context, 20,000 tier three is not going to fundamentally change the way you play. However, engineering and mathematics are, are going to fundally, fundamentally change the way you get speed ups and machinery and cutting and polishing are going to change the difference in how many gems you gather and that will have repercussions as you move through. There will be consequences based on if you focused on your economic tree or if you focused on your military tech. So early game T3 are essentially a gold pit released by Lilith in order to get you to spend money. So your low harvent is not gonna give you stone because they want you to spend money on stone. And then when they give you strat reserve, strat reserve will give you stone, but it won't give you gold, right? So gold is gonna be a really big bottleneck. You shouldn't be building a lot of gear and you should not for sure be investing basically anything into tier three because all of that stuff is gonna be really important for engineering and mathematics. After you've gotten engineering and mathematics done, and then you've also gotten machinery and cutting polishing uh, where they should be, you should be paying attention to your war tech. Now it's the fun stuff, right? You're gonna wanna unlock a one in all of these. Any, anything, you don't wanna go uh, any further than one. Do all your unlocks, one, 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 right? And then over here, the very first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna put throwing axemen and you're bringing it to T4. It does not matter if you have uh, tier two, tier three, or tier four early game, because you can simply upgrade your troops to tier four and you will be fine. It's not any kind of downside because when you upgrade troops, it takes the cost and the time to train those troops and transfers that into the new troops. So you actually literally lose nothing if you have tier two or tier four early game, which is why you can wait until like the first month or a little further to start training your tier four. When you wanna upgrade your war tech, you wanna make sure that everything is just about even and you only focus on the troop type you're going to main. If you're watching my guide and I'm gonna tell you the best troop type pre-season of conquest is going to be infantry. Once you get to Season of Conquest, you can unlock your cavalry, you can unlock your archers, and you can do whatever commanders you want. But if you're early game, do infantry, do yourself a favor, unless you are spending absurd amounts of money, you're going to want to go imp. Bodkin arrow should be one, pavis should be one, stirrup should be one, plate armor should be one, ballistic should be one, heavy frame should be one. Everything else, the big three over here, scutum, woot steel, and the little big three over here, these should all be raised about the same amount. So if combat tactics is seven, everything else should be seven. If combat tactics is five, everything else should be five. And you should just try and keep everything equal because uh, the further up you go, generally they have diminishing returns, right? So if 1% stats takes you like one day for one research, but it takes you like 50 days for another research, you know, there's a certain order in which you should probably be doing these things, which is by keeping them equal. That was not abundantly apparent. Again, you wanna pace yourself with your speed ups. If you can uh, spend your speed ups in the most efficient way possible, you can feel free to throw for the rafters. Just be careful to not overextend yourself early game if you cannot follow the most efficient uh, speed up spending guide detailed in chapter three. Okay, chapter 5.5. .5. Sorry guys, I totally forgot about training troops. So I'm going to put a little mini chapter in here. It's not super important, but obviously if you have no information, uh, I'm sure it's peace of mind to have that. Some of the frequently asked questions I'll get like, is it better to upgrade or train new troops? If you just unlock your tier four and you've got a bunch of tier two, tier one, and tier three, upgrading is totally fine. I detailed that in the last chapter in the research upgrade order, but upgrading is much better. You want a bunch of tier four rather than a bunch of tier two and tier three. Tier doesn't really matter a lot early game because you can't fill your marches anyway. And so if you can't fill your marches with tier four, uh, you know, 200,000 tier two or like, 50,000 tier four, uh, I mean, there is a difference. It's just not like super substantial. So just make sure to upgrade all your stuff, except for Siege. Siege, you wanna keep it tier one because the load disparity, so you're gonna see you're gonna have 20 load for a tier one battering ram, but for a tier four battering ram, you're gonna have a load of 26, right? So there's only a six load disparity uh, between tier one and tier four, and then tier four are gonna take like six times the time to train. So you're just going to want to train tier one siege and you're not going to want to upgrade them. Whereas everything else, you're going to want to try to train your highest tier and generally upgrade your highest tier as well. In terms of speeding up troops with your training speed ups, not your universals. I got my eye on you. You're going to want to speed up tier four troops or tier two troops, depending on what tier you unlocked. 
uh, generally for infantry. The reason why you want to focus on infantry specifically is because you're going to be an infantry player um, and you want the most infantry you can possibly field. There's not a huge reason to focus on cav or archers. I did it on my first account. God knows why. Just don't 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 follow my mistakes when you guys are training units if there is a lord of war which is going to be an event that asks you for a certain amount of power you're training power for troops you generally want to train tier two because those are the effi most efficient speed ups to power outside of tier five and i assume if you're watching this guide you're not tier five if it is an event asking you for power train tier two if it is an event asking you for a certain amount of speed up spent kind of like training day or now or never then training tier four is fine um so six is going to be grindable resources. This is going to be different from the resources that you can just farm on the map. And these are going to be limited and they're going to have to be spent successfully for you to be efficient and successful. Huh? They're going to have to be spent efficiently for you to be successful. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about is going to be your alliance shop and your silver credits. These credits, if you're free to play, should be exclusively used on passports. I'm not going to uh, blow through my alliance's uh, credits here. But one passport is going to be 600,000 credits and whatever uh, method that your kingdom uses to get passports, all of your credits should generally be going into passports because you ever want to migrate. The only other way to get passports is by spending money. So if you don't want to spend money specifically for passports, all of these credits should go into there. Another thing I would be okay with is if you're buying the first two, the five and the $10 sections of New World every single month, you could consider spending some in a VIP early game. I just wouldn't suggest that. I think investing into passports with your credits is generally the best move the next resource is going to be passports these things that you're buying are going to be used to go from kingdom to kingdom when you first start the game if you start a jumper you're going to notice that you have a beginner's immigration you don't actually have to use a certain amount of passports with that and it's kind of like a freebie however as you go through the game um, the higher power you get you have to spend much more passports than early game so if you're like below 10 mil power you'll only have to spend one passport but if you're above like 55 or 65 mil passport, uh, you might find yourself spending uh, like 40 passports. And being able to migrate just in case your kingdom goes to shit is really important. A good way of getting extra credits to get more passports is the Alliance Reclaim Shop. Very early game, I would stay very far away from this. Um, as you go through, there's going to be a lot of either blueprints or stars or sculptures or arrows or books that you no longer need because you're now tier five. However, really early game, you're not gonna need that many passports. I would stay very far away from the Alliance Reclaim section. It's not gonna be super important to your early game. Unless it is an emergency, then I would consider buying your passport just to make sure you can get out of the kingdom. But other than that, I would stay away. Next is going to be teleports. Uh, teleports are here to teleport you. I know, shocking. No one expected that. You generally just don't want to teleport a lot. If there's an event, if you just walk there early, you generally don't have to teleport yourself, and that's pretty good. You're going to get a whole lot of these early game, so just don't teleport too much, uh, because once you run out, the gem cost or the alliance credit cost is going to be super, super painful, and it's going to stunt your growth. Next is going to be keys. You got silver keys, you got gold keys, you got crystal keys. Crystal keys are going to be for equipment, gold keys are going to be your premium. Uh, silver keys are also pretty good. I wouldn't think too hard about these. You just open the chests as you get them. The reason why you generally don't want to hold these keys for too much is because they drop resources and they drop speeds. And although the 201 key achievement is something you're going to hear people talk about a lot, it really doesn't matter holding on uh, for them for too long. It, generally using them quickly is pretty good. On top of that, people sometimes have uh, these weird ideas of how RNG works. Like, oh, like if I save like X amount of keys and I open like X of them at a time, like I'll get X commanders. It just doesn't, it does not work like that. RNG is a very cruel mistress. The more superstitious you are, the more disappointed you're going to be. Next is going to be experience tomes. You're going to get these from barbs. You're going to get raw experience from guardians and you're going to get them from forts and you're going to get them from keys as well as vents. Uh, these are generally pretty plentiful and they should uh, go into your gatherers and primary commanders. I'm going to include more on XP usage in the commander's chapter. Uh, which is obviously there's going to be a little marker for it, um, but you should probably just watch through until then. Next is going to be stars. Stars should be used sparingly. Not everything needs to be four star, and they're going to be pretty rare early on, and they're going to bottleneck you really hard if you are fast and loose with your stars. Obviously, you can see I have a ton of stars, but that's because I've been playing for almost a year now. Uh, when you first start playing, the idea of six starring your first commander is going to be an absolute mountain. And the idea of six starring a legendary is going to scare you. So with that in context, not every legendary needs to be four starred or five starred. Uh, just because you have the experience, just because you have the stars doesn't mean you have to use it. Right? There are a bunch of legendary commanders that I, I just have no interest in bringing past like two or three stars. As I understand it, the best way to put stars in a commander is to put four of these bundles in 
and two of these dazzlings and that is the most efficient way to get stars in your commander if you do not have four and two using uh, two of any kind of special star and four regular stars is also quite efficient as i understand it and then obviously your bread and butter is you're just going to be putting in six stars at a time so be shrewd with your stars or face a very 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 painful bottleneck you're going to bottleneck basically no matter what you do but if you're not careful with them you know some people are going to get through it uh, relatively unscathed and some people are going to have level 50 commanders for a while these are legendary commander sculptures epic commander sculptures elite commander sculptures etc when people talk about gold heads these are what they're talking about these are pretty self-explanatory you just put them into whatever commander you want to scale up i'm going to talk more about these in the commander section if you are brand new to the game make sure you watch that commander section before you spend anything about these messing up your legendary commander sculptures early game is one of the most painful things people can do and absolutely sinks accounts it is definitely a restart territory if you misplace like 100 of these now i actually just turned in my arrows and books so i don't have a book here um, but arrows of resistance are going to be used for your watchtower and books are going to be used for your castle these arrows are going to be from barbs and the books are going to be from barb forts and will be crucial to getting tier five i'm going to talk more about this in the gem usage section because you're going to find yourself buying quite a lot of the books there's a fort if i rally it i get books of the covenant they're used to upgrade the castle next are going to be skill resets and talent resets Skill resets are going to reset all the skills on the commander and they'll give you specific commander sculptures in order to put them back in and talent resets are obviously going to reset your talents. These are both fairly rare and talent resets you can buy with gems or alliance credits and skill resets are exceedingly rare and it's something you get only through spending or through like special events or promotions in which they give you some. I would just keep these to yourself unless you have messed up a talent tree and you need to swap it for some reason, but you should generally not just be swapping talents willy nilly until you really know what you're doing. Uh, you're going to thank yourself for having saved these early game. Yeah, just hold on to it. Over here, these are expanded training. So you have from 1,000 to 50,000, which are called troop reserves instead of expanded training. These are used in situations where you're trying to train a lot of troops very quickly in order to win an event or when you're trying to cook troops. So if you look over here, I currently have 52,000 troops training. If you look over here, I have another 52,000 troops training. This is because way, way ahead of time, I was preparing for a training event that I'm going to see in pre-KVK, which I'll go over later. But because uh, I wanted to get a good rank on this, but I didn't want to have to spend 40 or 50 days of speed ups, instead of spending these speed ups, I can simply put in the reserve and cook the troops in there by leaving them for like weeks without having to spend any speed ups. Um, I can just condense all of my troop training until that very day and then it's a lot of value for me they're not super relevant early game so i just save them for now uh, if you have these i just just don't go willy-nilly with them. Next are going to be shields. If you've played any kind of kingdom builder before, you probably recognize these. These are almost, I don't want to say impossible to get. Obviously, you can spend gems for them, but they're very expensive and they're exceedingly rare. You should almost never be shielded. If you are shielding early game, that kind of makes sense because there are a lot of rogues early game. But if you're uh, like a month in and you're still shielding at night because you're scared that you might get zeroed, it's probably time to leave your kingdom. You should never really be in that much fear of getting uh, burned just because there's uh, a mutually assured destruction. So there's generally a lot of peace in early kingdoms. You may have to use these if you have a civil war. You may have to use these if you're very early game. But if you're about a month in and you're still like trying to shield or you're considering using gems or alliance credits on shields, you're in really deep shit and almost nobody is experiencing the same situation you are. So you should probably leave. Next is army expansions. You have a basic army expansion, which is plus 25%. If you have a 200,000 uh, troop march, that puts you at 250,000. If you have a 200,000 troop march and you're using the 50%, puts you at 300k. Generally, when you're fighting, you always want to be using a 50% expansion. It's going to be really important. Do not waste these. The 25%, if you waste some of them, it kind of doesn't matter. You're going to get like one or two every single week because of the fifth day of the Mightiest Governor event. However, the advanced army expansions are going to run you a shitload of gems later. These are really integral to fighting uh, and really expensive in your courier shop i don't have it open right now but every once in a while you will see in the third row it's going to offer you one of these 50 percent expansions for 1500 gems and that looks really expensive in early game you probably shouldn't be buying them but as you go further in the game it's really really important to be buying them up because they're super super good for fighting the open field so do not waste them other than that there are a few other boosts and a, a few other uh, grindable things but if i didn't cover them here they're probably not very important I mean, you do have food boosts, you do have gathering boosts, and you have like, you know, attack and defense. They, they exist, right? But they're not uh, super crucial as everything else is. You know, if you use a couple enhanced attacks, like nobody's going to tackle you.
Chapter seven, this is probably gonna be one of the most important chapters in this guide and it's gonna be over action points. Action points are the bread and butter of F2P and the bread and butter of anybody who's active in this game. It is the single biggest gatekeeper between you and T5 and between you and a large standing army. The more you can save and the longer you can make these last in terms of value, the better off you will be. So the single best place to use your action point recovery pre T5 early game is going to be in the pre KVK one. Again, I'll go over KVK one later, but your first stage is going to be something called Marauders. Marauders are going to be a special type of barbs. They're going to have like a little green skull over them and you're going to kill them and get parchment. And you're going to turn it in, right? A lot of these words don't mean anything uh, to you guys. So to put it as simply as I possibly can, all of these action points are going to be used to kill these marauders, which are like high level barbs. And all of these high level barbs are going to give you guys gems, materials, and speed ups and resources and alliance credits. If you are not yet tier five, which you're not going to be early game, the vast majority of players, these marauders are going to be the single best use of action points that you could possibly find in the game. So as soon as you see it, which you're going to see it about three months in, is where you just blow everything. After your T5, you're going to be looking at uh, probably KBK barbs. Some people do marauders still, but some people look to the season of conquest barbs, and I think those uh, are also fine. But pre-tier five, marauders are your best. So there is a way to make your action points go further than just attacking a barb and getting a reward for that barb. And that is something called barbarian chaining. Barbarian chaining requires you to attack one barbarian and to have an area of effect commander as your secondary. The area of effect is going to hit the second barb, and instead of you attacking it, it will attack you. Because you have to select a barbarian to attack it and use your action points, when they attack you, you get credit for killing these barbs, and you get the resources and rewards, however, you don't have to use any action points. Barbarian chaining is going to be the single best way to use your action points if you're looking to spend them in any meaningful capacity. Um, now this is very tedious, it takes a lot of time, and it doesn't give you a lot of rewards uh, compared to like doing general events or working on your farms. If you're going to do this, make sure you've already done everything else for the day. Another uh, place to use resources is going to be like Lohar's Longbow, Lohar's Buckler, Thieves, stuff like that. Um, generally, I think some Lohar's early game to get your Lohar to a usable spot is okay, but I would not put too much stock into doing Lohar's, especially once your Lohar is 5 of 5 1, and especially not into like Thieves or like different holiday action point expenditures. You can spawn these and they pop up next to your city and then you rally them and then you and a friend can rally them. Um, they're just not super useful compared to two-man forts. So next, what are two-man forts? So forts, you see them on the map, um, they give you books when you kill them, sometimes gems and resources and tomes. Forts are really, really good in order to get these books because every one of these books are going to run you 10 gems. So if you ever want to kill a fort, you should make sure that it's you and preferably only one other person. When I would do two-man forts, I would look for level one to three forts really early game because obviously level five forts are kind of difficult for you guys. I would rally it myself and then join with one troop from my farm. The reason why you'd want to join it with one singular troop, like I'm sending from my farm to my main right now, is because when you attack these forts, it will give you 100% returns. 100% returns uh, for any level of forts means five books in Home Kingdom. It doesn't matter if it's a level one fort, it doesn't matter if it's a level five fort. So I'm gonna cancel this because I wanna spend my AP right now. However, if I were to rally this fort and if it were to drop books, it would give me five books instead of the usual two or three you might get if uh, somebody used more than one troop. And if you want tier five, you need a whole shitload of these books. Another thing that they did is they changed the way AP comes out from forts. So previously, you could get unlimited action points by doing two-man forts with your entire alliance because in terms of the returns on the fort chests that you would get back, they would give you enough action points to where you could just infinitely do it and infinitely stack up AP. That is no longer the case. So now when you rally barb forts, they also have a chance of dropping 58 action point pots, and that's really good. So forts as a single player are much better now than they were previously. 
So before it was like, well, like maybe you'd want to do five man barbs in some situations if you're RDT5, but now it is you always want a two man forts uh, with all of your AP unless you're doing an event that requires your AP. Another thing you can do is something called five marching. This is generally not something you should do simply because there's not a whole lot of precedent on why spending all your AP very quickly is a good idea unless you're in an event that requires you to kill a lot of barbs or you're doing marauders. Then you only have a limited amount of time to spend your AP. So in that situation, I would consider doing so. In every other situation, I would consider doing forts before this. But to five march a barb, you would take five marches, you know, shockingly, and you would have them all attack a barb at the same time. Each one of these will spend action points, and although only one barbarian is dying, you will get the rewards uh, for each march as if they killed the barb individually. So I attacked uh, with five marches on my farm here. Um, and they will get five reports uh, for killing this barb as if they killed five separate barbs. This is a very quick way to spend your AP. If your AP is max and you don't have time to do forts, or uh, if you're trying to kill barbs for MGE, or if you're trying to do some kind of event that requires you to kill barbs, this is the fastest way to do it. I wouldn't suggest this because it's also the least efficient. Let's go into chapter eight, gem management. This is probably going to be one of the single most important parts of the guide. Of course, I see that probably about every chapter. But uh, this part is going to be really, really important. You are a dragon in this game, okay? You're not a dragon as in you're cool and you breathe fire. Your dragon is in you sit on your, your coins and you sit on your gems, okay? It is really, really important that you're not just blowing your gems on random shit. No one can take these gems away from you. You are the only person that can spend these gems poorly and fuck up your account. It is just you. It's nobody else's fault if you spend these gems poorly. More Than Gems event is going to be an event that comes about once every single month, and it is going to ask you to spend 25,000 gems each day, and it's going to give you 26 gold heads in return for spending 50,000 gems. This is something you should do every single time you see it, and all the way up until VIP 12, um, you should be putting 25,000 gems a day for the More Than Gems event into VIP. Once you get to VIP 12, you can decide to go for other things. However, it's going to be a long time before that happens. It's not common to get it earlier. You should not be putting gems into VIP without the more than gems event. It's not very efficient and it will probably sink your other investments. The next thing you should be doing is you should be 10 spinning the wheel. The wheel is going to be an event that comes every two weeks on a Tuesday of the second day of MG, uh, of MG the Mightiest Governor event. You will see universal wheels and you'll see specific wheels. Every commander that you care about, you should at least 10 spin or 100 spin. So the Richard wheel, the YSG wheel, and the Universal wheel are all going to be examples of things you should 10 spin. For specific commander wheels, um, if you want to go further, you should go 100 spinning the first Richard wheel or 100 spinning the YSG wheels are both good ideas. The most efficient ways to spend the wheels are 10 spins. The second most efficient way to spend the wheel is 100 spin. You should not do anything else than that. If you do not have the gems to go for 100, stick to 10, you're fine, it won't kill you. Next are going to be gear events. Gear events are not created equal. So for example, we just finished the Esmeralda gear event. There's going to be Esmeralda, Dalrooks, and these events are going to give you, uh, they're generally gonna focus on giving you materials for gems. However, they're not very efficient in giving you materials for gems. So with that in context, I would never do Esmeraldas and I would never do uh, Dalrooks puzzle box. There is probably a way that you can cheese the first level of Dalrooks, but I don't really have uh, exact estimates on the efficiency of that, so I would stay away from that for now. Better gear events are going to be the hammer event, uh, aka the uh, archaeologist dig. In order to do that efficiently, it's going to give you 30 hammers uh, every event. You're going to want to do three events worth of hammers or four events worth of hammers, and you're going to want to go to the fifth floor, which is when they give you legendary gear, and you're going to want to do that with however many hammers you have. As long as you have uh, about 100, 120 hammers, you should be able to safely go through the fifth floor without having to buy any yourself. So anytime you find yourself with over 100 hammers and you see an archaeologist dig event, you can go to the fifth floor and get yourself eight uh, legendary blueprints and then move on from the event. It's not something you should be spending gems on. The Holy Knight's Treasure is going to be, also known as the Egg Event, is going to be the best singular gear event in the game. It's always valid for a 10 spin and it's really good uh, super early game. I would also consider doing 100 spins on that just because it's so good, um, but that's something you would do after you've done more than gems and after you're at least 10 spinning your wheels and then you know, with the context of your greater account, then you would decide if you would ever do 100 spinning that. This is the only gear event that I would ever consider putting in uh, a lot of gems into. 7,000 gem event uh, events exist. They're holiday events generally, and you put 7,000 gems and you get 25 premium levels, but the event itself will give you 7,000 gems back. So I'll put it in here as a gem expenditure, but it's a 
uh, it's a wash, so I mean, you're not really spending anything. Uh, it gives you a bunch of sculptures and a bunch of other shit, and it's really good. So if you see the 7,000 gem event, uh, just make sure you complete all 25 levels and you're fine. With that being said, there aren't a lot of places where you're going to be spending gems. So more than gems event, 7,000 gem event, 10 spinning wheels for commanders you care about, 10 spinning the Holy Knight's treasure, and 100 spinning wheels or Holy Knight's treasure, right? And those are, should be basically the only places where you're ever investing gems. Outside of that, unless you have a exceptionally good reason, uh, you shouldn't be spending anything. Chapter 9. Commanders. This is going to be some of the more fun stuff uh, now that we've gone through more of the efficient spending sections. And we're going to go over the three types of commanders that are going to be important for us. We're going to have peacekeepers, we're going to have gatherers, and we're going to have combat commanders. The first is going to be peacekeepers. Peacekeepers kill barbs, they kill forts. The reason why peacekeepers are so important is because they have a talent called insight that lowers the total action points needed to kill something by 10. That's really important if you're five marching barbs and slightly less important if you're doing forts, but still important nonetheless. They also have quick study which is going to be important if you're doing guardians or if you're chaining 15 percent extra experience is going to be really good they also have trophy hunter every single time you kill a barbarian you're going to get resources for that Fifteen thousand resources per barb killed uh, adds up pretty quickly if you have got trophy hunter i would generally not put any experience into peacekeepers especially if you're doing guardians and the reason for that is is because uh, obviously they will be used to kill barbs so they're just going to be getting experience normally and they're not really good in combat you'll eventually just level 60 them all uh, over time it's not really something you should dump a bunch of xp into if you want to dump like xp into them to get to like level 9 or level like 15 in order to get insight and trophy hunter i think that's fine i just would not put any xp after that uh, you can just natural them by killing uh guardians so if you're barbing or if you're doing forts these should almost always be uh, primary unless you have a good reason not to and i would not focus super hard on bringing these past four stars the reason why i wouldn't want to bring lohar belly Boudica uh, past four stars early game is because early game they're not going to do a lot for you fighting wise and so it's just going to be killing barbs and if you're doing guardians you're going to have a whole bunch of your friends with you and if you're chaining you only really need maybe lohar and you know, you're attacking like lower level barbs, so it's not gonna make or break you based off it. And they're never gonna be used in combat, so just be very careful because you don't wanna bottleneck yourself on stars like we talked about earlier. Next is going to be gatherers. These guys are gonna be gathering your gems. Super, super duper important. You're gonna have three big breakpoints for gatherers. That is going to be level 29, 37, and 40. Level 29 is going to get you the more the better. That's gonna get you 6% extra resources every time you finish gathering something. Level 37 is going to get you superior tools, which is going to get you 25% extra gathering speed for any kind of resource. And level 40 is going to give you modified axle, which is going to give you an extra 30% march speed. So the very first thing you're going to want to go for is the more the better. The second thing you're going to want to go for is superior tools. The third thing you're going to go for is you're going to go back to this little corner and pick up modified axle. In terms of which gatherers should you invest in first, you should invest in your green gatherers, which is going to be Saturian, then your blues like Sarka and Constance. And then afterwards, you're going to, you can focus on your epics. I would not focus at all on your legendary gatherers um, as the lower the rarity of the commander, the less experience required to race it. And blue and green stars are super duper plentiful. Uh, so there's really no reason to focus on your legendaries before you focus on your greens and blues. Again, XP, stars, it's all going to be a bottleneck. So anytime you don't have to use your purple legendary stars is a time you should take. I would focus on leveling up gatherers uh, equal to marches that you have. So for example, if you're CH17 or CH20 and you don't have access to five marches, you probably shouldn't be leveling up five gatherers. So very early game, if you have, let's say, Gaius Marius, Centurion, and Sarka and Constance, right? Those are four marches at level 40 and you're CH22, you may want to start leveling up your fifth march once you get to CH22, but earlier than that, there's not a huge use for it. And leveling up your primary commanders, like perhaps Sun Tzu or Bjorn, probably find uh, more use for you. I would also consider Guardians uh, to be pretty good. You guys remember we talked about Guardians earlier because they gave drops that would increase your building or research speed ups temporarily. But just the killing of these doesn't require any action points, but it gives you experience. So really good commanders to bring on Guardians times for you and your alliance is Peacekeeper primaries and Gatherer secondaries to get all of your Gatherers to level 40. And then you can put a lot of your Tomes into your Gatherers as well. And then once you get to level 40, then you can focus on other things. It is important to note that there was a recent update to where even if your commander is not starred past where the experience needs to go, you can continue to stack up experience um, regardless of your star level. So just because you don't have the stars doesn't mean you're not still gaining experience. 
So if your Sun Tzu is level 40, four stars, you can still take him to Guardians and still get more experience for when you bring him to five stars. So maybe he's level 42 or 44. With all of this context, make sure that your gatherers are pretty high level as fast as you can, because if you're gathering gems, level 37 is going to be really important for gathering speed and level 40 is going to be really important for March speed. Every second that they are not uh, in a gem node because they're slow marching, you're losing gems. Every second that they don't gather gems faster because they don't have superior tools, you're losing gems. So gems are obviously going to be the lifeblood of your account, so make sure you have these pretty well developed uh, as early as possible. Last, but certainly not least, is going to be your combat commanders. You're going to have garrison commanders, which are going to garrison for your city. Uh, these are going to be largely irrelevant for the vast majority of players vast majority of players are never going to take a city hit, nor will they be garrisoning flags or center forts or any uh, of that sort. If you are a garrison and you have bad tech or bad comms or you're free to play or something like that, you're not only losing your own troops, but you're losing troops for your entire kingdom. It's actually uh, kind of a dick move um, if you're going to try and garrison as a lower spender or free to play, just because you're not just dooming yourself, but you're also dooming all of your allies. And I assume you don't hate your allies. This is the same for rally commanders. If you're a garrison, you're, you're your best uh, city defense is going to be a peace shield and if you're rallying you're going to be letting your bigger players handle it if you're ever curious about talent trees for different commanders you should generally google it a lot of people ask me for my talent trees i homebrew a lot of my stuff some of it has done me very well in the open field um, and some of it probably sucks right so you probably shouldn't listen uh, to me specifically on this you should probably just be googling common knowledge for like what most people do on talent trees you'll probably be fine with that if you're brand new the commanders uh, that you should run should generally be falling in the infantry category infantry are super super useful because all of their commanders uh, early game are going to come out on wheels or they will be free richard is going to come for a wheel alex is going to come for a wheel charles martel is going to be free bjorn is going to be free and Sun Tzu is going to be free. These are all really strong commanders. When I say free, I mean they come from keys, so you're not gonna have to invest any outside gem income into them. Also, YSG is going to be generally pointed towards infantry for the majority of the game until Season of Conquest, and then obviously you can use him with other troops, but he also comes on the wheel. The wheel is going to be a very good place to get your commanders because it doesn't require you to compete against anybody. You simply spend some gems and you have an average on like what your returns are going to be. Whereas, for example, if you were to focus on cavalry and look for Saladin, you'd have to compete in the Mightiest Governor event where the biggest and baddest of whales are clashing against each other. It's very difficult to get these comms. As an infantry player, you're looking at your epic commanders and you're trying to decide what you should look for first. The first commander you should expertise is Sun Tzu. The second commander you should expertise is Joan of Arc, and the third commander you should expertise is going to be Bjorn. These are your first three epic expertises, and they're all very useful for infantry. Sun Tzu and Bjorn are both good to bring to level 60 six stars. The reason why is because Bjorn will be a primary for Sun Tzu as a Bjorn Sun Tzu combo. Then later on, Sun Tzu YSG will be a combo where Sun Tzu is a primary to Yi Song Yang. I have an epic commander tier list for preseason of Conquest. I would check that out in the description below if you guys want more information on that. I would focus on getting probably Bjorn to six stars level 60 first and then Sun Tzu. In terms of legendary commanders, the first commander you're going to see that comes from the wheel is going to be Richard. I would 5 one 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 Richard. I think that's a fine investment. It doesn't spend too many legendary sculptures and he's pretty good for Sunset Canyon. He's decent for the open field early. He's good for any kind of PvE events. He's just a very high quality, low cost commander. After you bring him to 5111, when I say 5111, I'm talking about his skills. So this would be 5, this would be 1, this would be 1. Don't forget to use this lock function if you level him up early. You lock the skills to 1 to make sure you get him to 5111 because you don't want those skills just going randomly and having to use a talent reset. So you would 5111 him and then you would expertise YSG. Expertise in Commander is incredibly difficult and it takes a ton of sculptures. If you're a low spender and you buy Writers of History, it might be uh, slightly subsidized. If you're very good with your gems and you can 100 spin all three of the YSG wheels, you could probably uh, expertise him in a pretty timely manner. However, just because you spin all of the wheels to 100 doesn't mean you're going to expertise him immediately. Actually, generally, 100 spinning all three wheels will probably put you somewhere around 250, 260 sculptures. With that context, uh, that's like 5521, and that's not even halfway to the total sculptures you need, but you're going to need 700 sculptures to expertise somebody. If you guys want more information on this, I have my legendary tier list video in the description below. However, these first two steps in legendary commanders are going to take you a while, and you'll probably have a much better grasp of what you want for your account after you finish that. This is a short section. The learning curve on this game is incredibly difficult, and if this is confusing to you, you should check out the two videos I just referenced. There's a whole lot of context 
that I simply cannot give you because you don't have any base of knowledge or expertise in order to base the information that I would give you um, further on these commanders. So for right now, I'm asking as a gesture of good faith, if you guys would just trust me and go Sun Tzu, Joan, Bjorn, and then Richard 511 and YSG. If you guys can do those two things and check out those videos if you have more questions and want more in-depth guides on it, that's generally where you should stop. So next is going to be something uh, more complex and something more technical. This is going to be over gear. So the commanders are generally pretty straightforward. You can just kind of like spit out a couple commands and then you will just roll with that for the first few months and it's you know pretty easy to follow. Gear on the other hand is kind of counterintuitive. So you unlock the blacksmith at CH16. If you're an infantry player, you should always be building iron ore. For infantry, it's going to be iron ore. For cab, it's going to be leather. For archers, it's going to be ebony. This is going to be the primary material type for each uh, troop. So if you're going to be infantry, just make your iron ore every day and you should be fine past that. Very early game, you should be ignoring uh, gear because as I mentioned before in the research section, there's going to be a gold bottleneck because they don't give you much gold from the get-go and 3 million gold for a blue early game is gonna be really, really expensive. Don't let those quests tempt you and just focus on your actual account progression before you start dumping resources that you don't have into gear you don't need. The first set of gear that I would suggest would probably be an experience set if you will be chaining. When I say an experience set, what I mean is the blue pieces of gear that give you experience. This is going to be Expedition Warhelm, Commander's Heavy Armor, Saint Song, Greaves of the Exile, and Scarlet Hounds. If you have done a lot of Lohars as well, you will also have access to Lohar's Bone Necklace. However, because this requires so many bones and you never want to use universal materials or material choice chests on animal bones, it's not super useful just because you, know, you have to wait a while until you get these bones. If you are chaining, this XP set is super, super useful because you have a Peacekeeper primary and you have an AoE secondary that you want experience for. An AoE commander that you want experience for is like Sun Tzu or Ethelflaed. These are both commanders that you really want to level up. So putting a good XP gear, if you're going to be doing a lot of chaining, is really good. If you'll be doing Guardians and not doing any chaining, I probably wouldn't suggest the experience gear just because it's only useful for one march and you're going to be doing four or five marches. All of this experience gear, once you stop needing experience, is going to be disassembled later and you're not going to miss any of these materials. Um, it's just going to be like a gold sink cost to special talents, all of that, which is a little painful. It just depends on how far in the game and how well you're doing on your farms. So in terms of KVK combat, uh, Kingdom vs. Kingdom, or what you would look to field against other players, there is one base set of equipment that I would highly suggest. That is going to be the Windswept set. So if you're running an infantry march, let's say Bjorn Sun Tzu, I would want to have one Windswept set, the helm, the breastplates, the bracers, and the boots, ideally special talented, and I would also want to have one Gatekeeper Shield. For pants, I would consider running either the Ranger's Trousers or the Kyrax Humility once you unlock it. If you pull this from the tavern, you're a very lucky man, and you should build it as soon as possible. Infantry health is really, really good. If you don't have uh, the Humility from that, you can also get it from the Kyrax event. If you don't have it from that, you might get it from a Holiday event. And if you don't have it from that, then you're probably not going to see it for a minute. Uh, if you don't have access to that, Sentry Reaches is fine and Ranger Trousers is also fine. But generally, you really want that Kyrax humility. After you have this base set of gear, I would be looking for the Ho Cloak and the Infantry Set Helm. Ideally, I used to think Ho Cloak was the number one thing uh, to pick up, and I think it is fine to be that, but you can also pull it from the Tavern. It's about a 1 in 40,000 chance, but if you pull it, you're going to want to not have purchased the blueprint from the Holy Knight's Treasure event. The Infantry Set Helm is a, also a great piece to get first. Um, and then after the infantry set helm, in order to complete um, this 3% troop defense, you'd either get set gloves or set boots. Um, and then you'd also be focusing on the hoke look. These are the first few legendary pieces that you should be looking for. If you're looking for the Holy Knight's Treasure or the Hammer event, it is some combination or those pieces in the order that I just mentioned um, in which I would get it. If you can complete the set helm and the hoke cloak for KVK1 or like pretty early game, you will be in a really, really good spot for fighting in the open field. You'll have more specialized gear late game, but just having a plan of gear you're going to have and having the first parts of that plan is going to put you in a much better spot than the vast majority of people. Other than war sets, you should be making gatherer sets uh, for your gatherers. So your blueprints that you're going to get from the VIP shop, you get 15 a week. You can generally focus those on your first windswept set uh, so obviously your Bjorn Sun Tzu or your Sun Tzu YSG, because you're generally fighting with one march, um, is going to have special talents. But past that, you're going to be looking at your harvesters. And obviously, I practice what I preach. You know, I have all my special talented harvesters. As you move through the game, this is what your harvesters are going to be looking for as they give you 
more gathering speed and that means more gems. If you don't have the blueprints now, that's okay. Remember, uh, you're gonna get 15 every single week and eventually you'll special talent everything and blue blueprints will be a uh, worry of the past. I also have an equipment video if you guys are interested in that, that will also be in the description below. And that goes more in depth on gear, but overall, you know, focusing on, on the windswept set, the Kaurax Humility, the Gatekeeper Shield as your primary goal for every Imp March that you'll be running. And then focusing on set helm, hoe cloak, and then either set boots or set gloves as the next three pieces as upgrades. If you can do all of that, it'll be incredibly useful to your account. The next chapter is going to be over Expedition. Expedition is something that late game players just don't care about like at all. It's a formality kind of uh, to be talking about this, but essentially it is it's just a stat check. You either have the troops, you either have the commanders, or you don't the vast majority of the time. If you level your commanders, you keep your training buildings busy, and you're doing your forts every day, you'll be certainly fine to complete levels in Expedition at like an average or above average rate. There just isn't, there isn't much like wizardry uh, you can do. You'll find yourself stuck in a lot of spots and you're just not gonna be able to push, whether that's like uh, some kind of boss with like YSG or some kind of boss with like Freddy. It just is difficult to go past like these huge amounts of uh, commanders and there's less skill than I would like in here. If you are looking for like extra boosts, you can always look for alliance titles. You can look for kingdom titles. You can look for runes on the map from the guardians. The 25% expansions aren't super important. Again, you get one every single time you do MG. And then you can also consider like regular like 5% uh, troop attack or defense buffs would also be useful. So if you're like right on the cusp of finishing a level, you can consider popping a bunch of buffs in an expansion, try and steamroll it. I would just be very careful because if you're not very close, you could find yourself using a lot of time and resources that you really didn't need to spend for something you're probably going to complete in like a, a few days or a week anyway. So finally, what should you buy an expedition? When I first started the game, I would be looking for legendary commander sculptures. When I say legendary commander sculptures, I mean ones you get from keys like Charles Martel, Frederick, Ragnar, Cleo, Sundiok, Ashida, you name it, uh, Thutmos, stuff like that. And then I was also looking for stars, regular gold stars, gold bundle stars, and gold dazzling stars. I was not buying the epic ones. Once I could afford all the stars and all the commander sculptures I saw every day, then I would start buying Ethelflaed's. The reason why I wasn't hugely interested in picking up a lot of Ethelflaed's early, even though she's very good for free to play players, is because you will max her and Ethelflaed won't really be a bottleneck. 5511 Ethelflaed is really good, but it doesn't require many sculptures to get there. Whereas like her last two skills are not bad necessarily, but you're gonna get them eventually versus like the bottleneck on stars uh being able to reduce your bottleneck by buying stars in here is super useful so i personally had two level 60 legendaries at six stars by the time i was going to see combat in kvq1 that's incredibly difficult to do generally i was almost exclusively able to do it because i was buying stars in this once you have everything max obviously you can just kind of buy whatever like i buy like the training speed ups and stuff but i, I don't think too hard about it outside of like Ethelflaed, gold stars, and gold heads. I would not buy anything else in here. There's just no reason to. Perhaps really early game, if you wanted to buy like 10 or 20 constant sculptures to try and get her fourth skill a little higher, you could consider it. I think I did, I bought like three or four, but unless it's like at a break point, I wouldn't do it. It's just, because I don't think my, my constants is maxed even now. Hey guys, continuity break here. It is 12 inch from the future, coming at you with chapter 12, which somehow I managed to completely forget. That's gonna be the Sunset Canyon chapter. So I'm gonna go over it. Obviously, it's been a minute since I recorded, so I'm in season of conquest now, but these basic ideas will still hold true. So at your very start, you may notice I have some commanders that you guys are not used to. It's okay, don't worry about it. When you first start, you wanna put in your highest XP commanders, right? Those might be your gatherers, those might be your peacekeepers. This is not gonna be your permanent team, but you may just be starting with shit that you're not used to. A good example of this would be like a level 50 Lohar, right? If you have like four or five starred him like pretty early on, he's not actually bad as a primary. Obviously his abilities aren't great for fighting, but the higher level you are, the more troops you have in really, really early game since the canyon, it just matters how many troops you can feel. If you're going to be setting up a defensive lineup, what you wanna do is you wanna put your weakest commander in the corner and you wanna get the most AOE you can. Generally, you get the most area of effect by putting uh, Richard and Ethelflaed on the bottom if you're defending, or Richard and Ethelflaed on the top if you're attacking. So a good attacking position might be something like this, because Richard and Ethelflaed are going to do the most AoE generally to the most amount of people. But if you're defending, you'd rather have it look something like this. If on the side you have a mega tank, you may want him like in the back corner with uh, one piece of siege to slow him down. Having one piece of siege 
will uh, take out their buffs to open up, but it's not a huge issue because it'll be slow by the time it comes out. So they get to you slower if they plan to hit you from the side. If you have a duelist, you might want it in the front row, but when you run a duelist, they may just run it into you. So generally I like just having anti-swarm on the side. Yulji is generally pretty good anti-swarm. If you have one piece of siege and then they hit you, the siege disappears and it's not too bad. If you're trying to attack, I might attack somebody like Alunar here. I want to set it up so my Richard and Ethel are on the top rank. I see they have a duelist damage march on the side, so I want my Yulji as close as possible uh, to damage it and then come through the side. Alex is also a debuff, so this allows him to stay alive for longer and debuff more marches. Richard and Ethel flat on top is both good, and you always want tanks on the front line and your damage in the back line. Sometimes there's an argument to be made to have one up top or Ethel flat up top, depending on who you value more. Um, I just find Ethel flat up here generally hits all four targets. Uh, depending on how it goes. So here would be an example of this in play. Okay, over here we have Ethelfled. Maybe I'd want to put a Siege on Richard in order to make him a little bit slower. Um, so she'll hit more targets, but again, that's something you tweak on your own. Generally, uh, just depending on the march speed of your individuals, you can make sure it gets there faster or slower. You see this march on the side um, isn't necessarily winning, uh, but the debuff in the shield is hitting a lot of people and it's been alive for a while, so it's not a huge issue. Um, other than that, that's that's basically it for this. Uh, it's a pretty easy dub ski. Um, but yeah, it's just a quick little rundown on Sunset Canyon. There's nothing uh, too crazy about it. Another thing I would say probably the most important thing is like winning or losing is kind of important early on, but not super important. If you guys are looking to do Sunset Canyon, I would do it generally right before reset because then nobody can hit you back and you probably get as high as you possibly can. And then if you're at the end of the week, uh, I'd probably give yourself like 10 minutes to do like all like 20 attacks you have. Uh, on the Sunday before the weekends. That's about all the advice I have for it. Uh, Sunset Canyon is generally like a pretty quick and easy thing, so I wouldn't worry uh, too hard about it. So chapter 13, events. All non-competitive events must be done, okay? If you're playing this game, if you're, you're for real out here, every single one of these has to be done. So Soroli Crisis, every single time that pops up, you better finish it, you better spend your coins. Every single time you see Cowrack Ceremony, it better be the highest difficulty, better be level 50. You better be doing all the Alliance bosses. If there is an event that does not require you to spend anything but time, it better be done in its entirety every single time you do it. A really good example of something that is sometimes difficult to do would be Ark of Osiris. So if you're not in the main Alliance's Ark of Osiris, make sure you're in an Alliance's Ark of Osiris, okay? If you get to 10,000 points, it is either five sculptures if you lose, plus like a uh, thousand and something gems, or uh, 10 sculptures if you win with 2,500 gems. That's a huge amount of gems and sculptures that happens every single two weeks that you should never miss. Make sure you're in there. Make sure you're talking to your, your alliance, or different alliances, to make sure you always have a spot. If you're in Ark of Osiris, a lot of people will be confused on how, I, how you could possibly get to 10,000 points. One of the ways that you get to 10,000 points is by going from node to node rather than just gathering one at a time. The reason why I say going from node to node instead of gathering one at a time is because a lot of people will want to fight early game, but their troops are so weak, uh, it won't be very impactful for them. And so they're not gonna get a lot of points because all their troops are just gonna die and then they're gonna be stuck between deciding to heal or not. So over here, you can see a node. Over here, you can see my march is camped. In my march right now, I have a total of 1,250 gems. The reason why is because my march doesn't go home. Every single time my march finishes gathering gems, I send it to another gem, right? This way, instead of going home and back, every single time I want to gather a gem, I simply go gem, 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 and eventually it comes home after a very long time. So you can do that in Ark of Osiris by overfilling your marches past what they'd normally be able to gather. So like this can fit like 4,000 gems in it. And so it's not going to come home until either A, I have to bring my marches back, or B, it fills up. If you guys are interested in more uh, information on Ark of Osiris, you can always go to my Ark of Osiris video, which I'm going to put in the description below. So a another couple events that I want to put disclaimers on. The Mightiest Governor event is a great e example of an event that you should not go for. This event is incredibly competitive, and unless you are a mega whale, you're going to fall face first and cry. If you are pre-tier 5, there's simply no way you will be able to compete with somebody who is tier 5 points-wise. I suppose you could, but the value of which, in terms of the speed-ups and resources you spend, and the efficiency, which will be questionable since you only have a couple days to be training or pushing, is definitely going to put you at risk. Once you hit T5, you can start to decide on how you're going to do things differently, but pre-T5, you should not be focusing on MGE. The commanders are not going to be super relevant to you, almost any situation. And even if you do get sculptures, it's probably not going to be worth all the effort that you put in that you put in other events. A good example of an event that would give you good returns is a 20 sculpture event. So generally, they'll come around the same time as overwhelming strength. This isn't a 20 sculpture event, but it's very similar. So a sculpture is generally worth about 700 gems a pop. 
uh, in terms of like what we actually value it, right? So you, for VIP 13, you could go to the VIP shop and you could see them for 2000 a piece. However, we would never buy them for 2000 a piece. That's not actually their market value. If somebody offered me a sculpture for 700 gems right now, um, that is right under the overall value of a 100 spin on the wheel. With that context, 650 gems is just about a sculpture. So if I did this whole event, it would give me about four sculptures worth of gems or just four sculptures. If I were to do a 20 sculpture event and I got top 10, it would also give me four sculptures. Generally, when you see the 20 sculpture events that look kind of like this, except they're gonna have a ranking, uh, getting to top 50 or top 100 and completing the event to get the speed ups in between is a really, really good way to do that. It allows you to kind of like subsidize your pushing, especially early game where you don't have like kingdom buffs or like 15% uh, speed ups. It's a good way to speed things up and keep yourself progressing while simultaneously uh, recouping the speeds you lost in opportunity cost by not speeding up uh, super efficiently. The faster you can get to higher power, the faster you will be able to do uh, events more completely. Like Sorolic Crisis is a really good example of this because if you're not 50 million power, you know, you're going to have reduced rewards. So like for me, this is going to give me 2,250 Sorolic coins. However, if you're 500,000 power, this is going to give you 300 coins, right? But let's say instead of 500,000, you hit the next breakpoint, 2.5 mil, right? It's going to give you past double your rewards. So with events like this, which there are a couple, scaling up in power is really important, especially early game. So I'd focus on these 20 sculpture events. Something a, I like to say is complete, but not compete. So you might complete the entire event and it might give you top 100. It might give you top 50. We don't want to shoot for the rafters. So if you're in a game of power event, like getting top 100 is one sculpture and that's fine. You can do that for 10 events and it's just like having a second place, except you spend significantly less and you get all the little rewards from completing all the little steps. As you go further on, competing in 20 sculpture events, uh, especially like a game of power or now or never, is possible to win maybe one or two, but competition is like pretty fierce. So you have to pick wisely what you see the rankings like and who's pushing and how you would deal with that. Chapter 14, we're almost done guys. KVK. What is KVK? People are always asking, people are always talking, you know, kingdom versus kingdom, kingdom versus kingdom, you're gonna hear this uh, thrown around a lot. Each kingdom versus kingdom is going to be a little different. Kingdom versus kingdom season one was recently changed. So your guys' kingdom versus kingdom is going to be a lot different from the ones that are gonna come afterwards. Um, but generally, you'll have four to eight uh, kingdoms competing against each other in some kind of uh, team effort to try and get to the middle of the map and collect the Great Ziggurat, which is very similar to the Lost Temple. Before you start Kingdom vs. Kingdom, you're going to have three separate growth events. These are going to be Marauders, which is the single best place to spend your AP pre T5. Then it's going to be Training. It's actually why I'm cooking my troops right now. I have 126,000 troops um, that will pop in like six days is because I'll have Training at that point. I don't want to use Training Speeds for it. So in order to help out me and my Kingdom, um, I just cooked these troops for like a couple weeks. And the third one is going to be barbarian forts, or I believe they're called uh, bar barbarian encampments. I wouldn't really worry about the forts. They're not like super impactful unless your kingdom is going for like uh, rank one out of all the kingdoms on this, in which you'll you'll probably know. I generally wouldn't spend event. Uh, I wouldn't spend AP on it just because it's not really important. The marauders are going to be the best place to spend AP and training is a good place to get points if you want to cook troops. For KBK1, if you're not in leadership, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Make sure you're in the strongest uh, kingdom in your continent. So you know you're going to be going against one of the three other kingdoms when you look in your continent over here. You know, you, you know you're going to go against one of these, right? So if you see one of them has a little star on it, or you see one of them is much bigger than the others, you're going to want to go there generally in order to make sure you win. Winning KVK1 is going to be really important for you. So just make sure you migrate to the strongest kingdom on your continent. But other than that, don't worry too much about it just because if you're just starting the game, it's going to be like three months and uh, you know, there's a, a whole lot of complexity there. It's not going to be super relevant to you. And of course, you know, make sure your kingdom is peaceful. You know, even if it has a star, if it's going through a civil war, it's not somewhere you want to go. So chapter 15, this is going to be over just like rather miscellaneous stuff, stuff that I get questions about and stuff that you may see on the map that you may care about. The first thing I'm going to talk about is going to be camps and keeps. So this is a camp. No, 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 no. Dad, we have any that are alive. Okay, so this is a camp and it has an Iron Hand Baller. These guys are going to be really, really easy to kill early game and going to be rather difficult to kill mid game and then pretty easy to kill late game. Camps are going to give you 30 gems in one hour of speeds every single time you kill it. It might also give you a golden key. It might also drop a blueprint. It might also give you materials. It could also give you purple stars. If you're a really early game, these are awesome to kill. You should kill as many of these as you possibly can. A really early game, it literally just needs like a few hundred tier one and you just run them across the map and you kill as many as possible. It's a ton of speeds, ton of keys, ton of gems. You should just kill, just spam them. The, the return on investment in terms of like time for your tier one units is crazy. 
a really early game, do as many of these as possible. The next one is going to be keeps. Unless you are a whale, these are not going to be super useful. These do drop the lanes, which isn't bad and the camps drop silent trial, but keeps are just not uh, worth the time investment. If you're a whale, you may be able to clear it, but even if you're able to clear it, like it's gonna give you one reward every three days and maybe a few blueprints. So you'd have to kill a lot to really make it worth it. And generally that involves like a lot of teleporting and stuff like that. If you want to join your alliance to kill one of these every three days in order to get these rewards, I think that's totally fine. I just wouldn't make a habit of doing keeps. Uh, they're not great. Next is going to be the map and building rundown. Your map isn't going to be really impactful. It may feel impactful when you first start playing because your whole map is fogged and so you only really know what's around you and you can only see like a few city halls and everything's mysterious and dangerous, but in reality it's just not uh, super effective. So the, the first thing you're going to do is sanctums. Like a ton of people are going to get a ton of different sanctums and they're going to give you like general words and that's pretty good. That's going to be the first thing that comes out probably like a few days in. The second thing that comes out is going to be altars. I believe that comes in a little after a week. After that is going to be your level two pass, and then you're going to have access to uh, zone two. Actually, the first it's going to be the the level one pass, and then you're going to have to have access to the the other zone ones. Then you're going to have access to the level two pass into zone two, access to shrines, which are just bigger and badder uh, holy sites. Then you're going to have access to pass three, which is going to put you into zone three. Then you guys are going to try and connect to the lost temple. And sometimes there's a civil war here, so you know just keep your, your ear to the ground. And the leader of the alliance that takes the Lost Temple is going to be crowned the king, and you know they're probably going to start spending a bunch of gems taking care of the kingdom. That's that's just about it. There's not uh, any like super complexity or like mystery to it. Every kingdom goes the same way in terms of like what unlocks and when. Generally, if there's going to be civil wars, there's going to be civil wars like at the very start where the jumper group lays its nuts on the table and lets everybody know how the kingdom's going to go. There's uh, sometimes a civil war for the Lost Temple. Uh, depending on like if there's a rotation or who wants what um, generally you'll have like really inexperienced players like really desperate to get to the middle and the middle it just doesn't matter that much whoever owns the lost temple is just going to be shelling out a bunch of gems to keep buffing the kingdom to make sure everything's growing and generally you'll see like the hallmark of more experienced players is they don't want to spend those gems next is going to be guardians so generally the highest level of guardians whether that be shrines whether it be lost temple whether it be sanctums or altars are generally going to start at like 0 10 or 0 30 utc or like 0 20 something like that um, and you do them as an alliance uh, unless like your alliance specifically tells you that you can kill guardians without asking for anybody like for example so these like nobody does guardians in my kingdom anymore except for like lost temple guardians right so if i killed these no one would care however when you're early in the game people might care you can get kicked and zeroed over doing these guardians uh without telling anybody so make sure you ask your alliance r4s or your alliance leader for like what times you guys are going to be doing guardians at because there have been civil wars over guardians so just be aware that these are very important uh, experience wise, especially if you're not chaining. They're probably going to be, they reset like every 12 hours. So it would be done at like 0 20 UTC and like uh, 1220 UTC, something like that. And they also reset after an update. So if something's just about to update, uh, generally they'll try and clear the entire map of Guardians and then they'll reset and then obviously you can kill them again. Next is going to be what to buy in the VIP shop. I talked about the VIP shop earlier when I talked about the golden sculptures and I talked about the blueprint chest fragments. Anything in here that is worth resources, you should buy. Even if you have all of your purple commanders at level 60, these can be turned in for Alliance credits and obviously those are your for passports and you can only get those with money. So every single thing in here that you can buy with resources, buy with resources. In terms of spending gems, I think the vast majority of players should not spend gems in here. If I were to spend gems, the things that I would consider spending gems on, if I really needed it, an army expansion is probably not a horrible idea. And if I really needed it, the advanced attack is probably also not a bad idea. The legendary commander sculptures are almost always terrible here, and the gear purchases are also really bad. Um, if you're buying resources or stars, um, you have mental issues and I don't know what to do for you. The equipment materials choice chests are sometimes a decent choice depending on how badly you need materials, but generally the gear events like Holy Nice Treasure is just a much better way to use your gems looking for gear. And if you're uh, looking for speed ups, the gear and wheel events uh, also give you a lot of speed ups. So there's not a whole lot of reason to like purchase stuff from here. The next chapter, chapter 16, is going to be over some do's and don'ts. I'm just gonna go over like a few short sentences over like random etiquette of stuff you should do within kingdoms that will make you uh, not cringe. Do keep yourself safe and in a peaceful kingdom. Shit is burning around you, you should be ready to migrate and you should have a peace shield, okay? Just be like wholly aware of what's going on around you and keeping yourself safe is really important. If you get zeroed, you're fucked. Don't go around burning people's cities. Uh, when you burn other people's shit, you are asking, you're asking to get mauled. Okay, especially if you're free to play, especially if you're a low spender, you'll get slapped up and you'll have your neck broken. 
Okay, and the only person to blame is yourself because you went out and started some shit. You want resources? Make farms. Don't go burning. Do make friends with bigger players. They'll help you with resources. They might help you with events like Ciroli, Ian's Ballads. They might help you with Shadow Legion. These are all events that are non-competitive that all they would have to do is extend a helping hand in, in you know, hook you up with. Uh, they might also give you some resources just because they're they're pretty big. Things that you may see as expensive, they might see as cheap. So bigger players are really, really good friendships. Also, they're just like generally pretty knowledgeable in terms of like IRL and interesting people. So it's not like super difficult uh, to make friends with like accomplished people because they're generally pretty interesting. Don't beg them for things as it will damage your reputation. Generally, you have to more more than likely organically be friends with people. If you, you know, if you're kind of like putting up a facade for, for a whale and then, you know, you just start like begging them for shit, uh, it's gonna make you look really bad. And when people are looking around because they're angry for like people to zero, or maybe you're like hopping for rewards or shit like that, um, they may just ice you. So don't don't be uh, too clingy and you know make sure there's uh, some kind of like organic friendship in there if you're looking to be a parasite. Do listen to your alliance leaders generally. Your R4s and R5s hold a lot of sway in the alliance. Every one of your bigger players is generally subservient to them in some way. If you are not listening to your alliance, you could be kicked, you could be zeroed, uh, they could read you for rewards, a whole lot of shit uh, goes down if you don't listen to your mails, so make sure you read that. Don't berate them in public. If you disagree with any kind of your alliance leaders over anything, just PM them, uh, or, or PM a bigger player, or make some kind of call, or like have some kind of discussion. If you berate your alliance leader uh, publicly, I don't know if anything good has ever come from that. Actually, now th now that I I think about it, I was like I was like, well, you know, maybe no. Um, I've never heard of that being successful, so don't do that. Do be active a couple hours a day. I think probably like three to four hours a day is a really good sweet spot for Isaac Kingdoms. Uh, that's generally uh, the activity I like to have. Sometimes I go a little lower because, you know, honestly, I get a little lazy in Home Kingdom. But three to four hours is like a really, really good safe time um, when there's like little to, to no events. And then, you know, you chain with whatever uh, time you have left in the day. Don't play 10 hours a day and burn yourself out. Some people will look at my account and they'll be like, wow, you know, like T5, 182 days. It's crazy. Like I'm going to chain for like eight to 10 hours a day and I will smash a record, right? And then they try it for a week and then they stop playing. I don't chain for 10 hours a day. Even during strategic reserve, which is probably the most activity I have in my account, I don't play 10 hours a day. The only time I'll ever play like anywhere near that much or more than that is during wartime, right? If you're fighting, you know, it's the, the catharsis, the culmination of all your grinding. Of course, you can fight for extended periods of time and you won't burn yourself out. However, if you're like chaining 10 hours a day, you will quit the game in like a week or a month or, and you know, that'll be it. Uh, you know, you're looking to have fun at the end of the day. It is a game. Do join your KD or Alliance Discord. Joining in like voice chats or like just typing to people is really good socially. And if people are looking around to like give people rewards or uh, give people like more responsibilities or keep them in the know, all of this information is generally first put to the people that they actually physically know, right? So if your Alliance leader is like in a Discord, you know, it may bequeath you to either, you know, keep chatting with him or hop into VC. You know, there's nothing... Uh, really goes wrong with uh, being social. Don't be a spaz. So being social, good. You know, you're, you start spamming stuff or saying probably like socially uh, unacceptable or inept things, you're obviously going to fuck yourself over. So don't be cringe, congrats. 17, a bonus section could be a spending guide. Now I am free to play and this is a free to play guide. However, I know a lot of low mid spenders and even sometimes whales watch me. Um, I know because now I do coaching as you can see at the, uh, at the left of me right here. And the vast majority of the people that pay for coaching, shockingly, are like pretty high spenders generally. With that context, given a lot of advice for how to do spending, and I will give a quick little spending breakdown. So the single best thing you can buy ever is going to be the growth fund. This as a value is probably the single highest value you could possibly get in the game. I think Lucerin proportionally might be slightly higher value, but just having raw gems is crazy. If you spend $15 in the game, your first $15 should always go to growth fund. Your next $5 should go to Lucerin Scrolls. I, I believe it's like every uh, two months or three months, you get access to Lucerin Scrolls. And for $5, uh, you can get this bottom section. This bottom section is going to always give you um, expansions, gems, VIP, AP, crystal keys, a legendary blueprint, just a whole lot of crazy stuff and, and like sculptures. It's great. This is like the best $5 you can possibly spend in the game. After that, I would consider buying monthly gems. Your first purchase of monthly gems is going to be 50% off. So it's going to be $5. But after that, I would do the $10 a month. It's really good. After that, I would do gear and commander pop-ups. So every single time you unlock a commander, it's going to give you a $5 bundle called Writers of History that gives you 10 legendary sculptures. It's an incredibly valuable bundle. 
every single time you make a new legendary equipment, it's gonna give you something called a Vanquisher bundle. And that's also, I believe, a $5 bundle, and it gives you like four uh, legendary materials, which is also really good. You also have like lesser gear and commander bundles for maybe like epics or like hitting like level 40 on legendaries or uh, unlocking like different gear things. I think all of these bundles are generally really good, and I put them around the same, uh, same value. So gear and commander pop-ups are awesome. I would focus on those. Next, I would focus on monthly speeds. If you have access to the 30-day research speed-up supply, I think this is a good purchase and has a good return on investment in terms of minutes of research speeds. Since uh, most universal speeds are going to be research speeds up until you hit T5, these are basically universals and they're very, very high value compared to any kind of super value bundle. Ironically enough, the super value bundles are some of the worst value bundles in the game. After that, I would be looking at the weekly materials. This is a really good value for $5. Buy it once a week as great uh, returns. After that, I would probably pick up every other pop-up you see, whether that be a fate changer, whether that be a new tier of troop unlocked, whether that be uh, an academy level unlocked. All these pop-ups are all really good and they're better than anything in the shop other than what I just said. After that, I would focus on getting weekly speedups. This doesn't look like a whole lot, but if I remember correctly, this is about four times as valuable as the other super value bundles. So if you're looking between War Machine and the seven day speedups, seven day speedups is better speed up wise. Of course, War Machine has like expansions and uh, resources as well and some VIP. However, I don't consider those to be as valuable as the raw speedups, which is why you're buying these. After that, I would consider doing the daily special offers. For $5 a day, um, after everything I just said, these are very, very valuable. Uh, you can get some great commanders. Starting out, you only have access to Chacha, but depending on like which commanders you're looking for, why she's good, Alex is good, Mehmed's fine, Richard, Martel. Um, these are like all good choices to pick up from this. And then obviously you have access to Season of Conquest commanders as well. Like Artemisia is probably not a bad daily purchase either. Um, on top of that, the daily special offers will also give you a gold key, good hours of speeds, and they will give you 500 action points. Uh, action points cannot be purchased in any other way in the store. So buying this every day is generally pretty good. After the daily chests, I would consider buying the first two sections of New World every month. So the cheapest value you can possibly get for money for passports is $5 a passport. Generally, if you ever buy any kind of bundle, you want to buy the entire bundle because the gold chest tier of that bundle is going to be the most efficient. However, with New World, you're looking for the most bang for your buck in passports. So you don't care about the speed ups. You don't really care about the uh, resources, you're looking specifically for the passport pages. So generally, every single month, which is when this resets, people will buy the first two sections of that. After that, the holiday bundles. So for example, there's probably going to be a Halloween bundle coming up uh, at the time that this is recorded. And the Halloween bundle would be probably the next best to pick up after that. After that, I would consider Call of the Ancients. This comes out every single time that Ark of Osiris comes out. After that, if you are pre-T5, Fountain of Wisdom is probably okay. After that, I think War Machine is probably okay. After that, I think the special resource bundle, the gold tier, this is a pretty good quantity of resources, so I'd probably do that afterwards. And after that, I would consider all other packs. I did miss King's Coronation. I'd probably put that in the, the same category as the Holiday and uh, Special Limited Time bundles. And then uh, the Dig Event bundle would also be in there as well. With that being said, guys, that is that is it. That is the whole guide. You guys actually sat here and listened to what is probably like an hour and 45 minutes to two hours worth of Rise of Kingdoms content. Um, I hope this helped you guys tremendously. Please consider using the resources that I've linked in the description below that I alluded to multiple times during this. If anything confuses you, please watch the section first and then feel free to comment in the comments below or at me on my Discord. My Discord is probably like the number one place to get information, um, second to me, but I'm also on there. so. There's that. If you guys are also interested, we live stream almost every day. And I put notifications when I go live also on my Discord in the description below. So make sure you hop in there. If you guys really uh, enjoy the content, please drop a sub, a like, a comment, all that good stuff. If you guys are interested in supporting the channel, I also have a Streamlabs donation link in the description below. We also have a merch store in the description below as well. We've got uh, phone cases, hoodies, t-shirts, the works. And now that I am done shilling for myself, I hope you guys have an absolutely great one. If I have to add anything onto this, I will consider making um, maybe like a, a supplementary, like small video on top of it, but this should be pretty thorough. So yeah, have yourselves a great day and I'll see you all later. Good luck.